Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Bill. I really appreciate it. My name is uh, Matt Costi, as Bill mentioned. Um, I'm the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited in Fayetteville, New York. I am also a Fayetteville, New York resident. So, uh, so this is home and this is where, this is where we do business. So, um, you know, when, when Bill asked me to come on, there's a number of different things <clears throat> this time of year that are really happening um, in the avian world. And, you know, chief amongst those is the migration. Um, so, you know, in fall, we always think about fall time being that time of change, right? That time of transition, and then certainly the time of migration. So, you know, that's something that I wanted to touch on today um, was migration, what that means, um, why birds are doing what they're doing. And, and then, you know, also there's some exciting stuff because this changes every single year. Um, this particular year, um, we're calling for a very eruptive migration, um, which means that there's gonna be a principal change to the birds migratory patterns this year. So we're gonna see birds that we usually don't see um, that are gonna be here uh, this winter that we, that we typically don't see. So um, again, this is an evolving thing. This is, you know, there are some rules, quote unquote, around migration, but really um, what what it really comes down to is they're looking for food and they're looking for light. So um, when birds are migrating, um, those are the two things that they're looking for. I'm a, um, I don't know, some of you may know my story, but I'm a farm kid from the Midwest. And I can tell you one irrefutable truth, which is all animals are motivated by food. And that includes us. So they are food driven um, and they are, they are obviously looking to perpetuate to the next, um, uh, to the next generation. So um during the migration season, you know, let's, let's define what migration is first of all. Okay. So migration, you know, we think of migration as these big, big, big distances that are traveled by these, by birds and butterflies um, um, that they make down to Mexico and down to Central America. And that certainly is true um, of several species. So species like your Baltimore Orioles, your hummingbirds, um, rose-breasted grosbeaks, those guys are all flying way, way south during the winter time because that's where their non-breeding grounds are and we're in their breeding grounds uh, in the summertime. But what, what a lot of people don't realize is that a migration can be simply moving from the top of a mountain down to the valley. That can be a migration. Um, going 20 minutes south can be a migration. And that a lot of times does make the difference between you know, survival or, or not. They're, they're searching for food. Um, so, so right now we have this really transit transitionatory or transition time that's happening, um, going from, you know, from summer where everything's competing for their own territory for mating rights to now, um, things are just really starting to, uh, flock together. So that old saying birds of a uh, feather flock together, that's really what we're seeing right now. Uh, in the fall, birds will start to band together because they're they're uh, concerned about safety first of all. So more eyes uh, equals equals more safety for them. Um, the second thing is food. Um, more eyes that are out there, birds can definitely see more food. So it's 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 analogous or it's the same as when you see fish that ball up in the ocean. Um, those fish are all balling up because the pack, um, the, the pack is stronger than the individual. So that's what you're seeing right now is a lot of birds that'll flock together. So one of the most interesting ones are, um, everybody knows the chickadee, right? We know our chickadees. So chickadees and tufted titmice will actually come together this time of year um, to do that same, to do that same thing, to, to hunt, to look for, um, to look for, uh, predators that are out there and tufties and, um, um, chickadees, pardon me, are, they're related, they're cousins. So that's what starts happening is these things start to really band together to get them through winter because they know that next year they're going to have to compete for territory rights again. Um, and they're going to have to reestablish that territory as, as their own. So, you know, uh, again, reasons that reasons that they migrate, um, it's going to be primarily because of food and, and light. So um, over 300 different species of birds migrate in North America. Um, a lot of birds don't migrate. There's also birds. Some of them will migrate and some of the pack stays behind. You know, one of the most famous of those is the is the American goldfinch. Right. 
we see these beautiful yellow birds flying around all summer. And, and a lot of people do believe that they, that they leave for the year. Some do, some fly south, but we have a number that stay, that stay here. They just change from a yellow to a really, really drab green brown, almost, almost look like a sparrow from afar. If you, if you, if you didn't know the difference. So, you know, a lot of birds that people think migrate also do stay here. Bluebirds, um, bluebirds will stay year round um, in, uh, in New York. Um, really, it comes down to a base, which is food, shelter, water. So if we can provide a, a good food source, and that, that also means natural food source. So right now you have a bunch of service berries that are coming up and winter berries, um, all those good berries that the birds are eating on right now. So if they can have a natural food source and a supplemental food source, um, there's a really, really good chance that not only are we going to help them survive, um, but we can actually draw them to our property um, as well. Um, there's also some evidence that age, um, that sex, you know, some of these things play a role in migration. Um, but the reality is, I mean, they've been doing this for millennia and it's really hardwired in their, in their DNA to have this big migration back and forth. And it's, it's all about survival. Okay. And we talked about, you know, I just touched on earlier how long these trips are, you know, in some instances, it's 7,000 miles. Birds are flying 7,000 miles to get to their breeding grounds um, to their non-breeding grounds, which is just, it's spectacular. But again, it can, and they go to the Caribbean, they go to Latin America, they go to Mexico, they go to the Florida Keys. But again, a lot of them come just down from a mountaintop to the, to the valley. That's going to help them survive, go from a high elevation to a low elevation. So again, migration just means movement. They're moving from one place to another. Okay. Um, and really, it's not completely understood. Um, it, it really birds. It appears that most birds do orient themselves for migration for, from the stars. That's that's what we believe is that the stars are waypoints for them, um, which is which is interesting. And we had such a good we had such a good bird year this year. And a, and a lot of the reason that we believe that that happens is a COVID experience that a lot of people went inside. And when we had a lot of people inside, the one thing that people really don't think about when it comes to migration is light pollution, because if birds do navigate by the stars, right, how, how many people have seen a star in New York City in the sky? I never have, right, because there's too much light. So light pollution really takes away their ability to see the stars. And when everybody was inside this year, there wasn't the amount of light pollution. So I think that that really, that really aided the birds this year in their, in their migration. So that is, you know, that's one of those kind of offshoots of the COVID thing um, where we did see just not in the bird world, but we saw in all of nature, you know, things kind of reclaiming their territory and coming back into their, to their space. I know we think it's our space, but it's, it was their space, right? So they're encroaching back in on, on their space. Um, so, you know, a lot of people also, one of the interesting things, questions I get a ton about migration is just truly how do they survive? You know, how does a bird go that far and survive? And um, the biggest thing for them is storing up on fat supplies when they're migrating. So those are going to be, you know, caterpillars, spruce caterpillars, tent caterpillars, you know, things that are really, really nutritious um, for them. And then things that we can do, you know, as, as, as birders and backyard feeders, anybody that's a backyard feeder, you know, feed high quality fatty seeds and feed some suet this time of year. You know, they really need it. They really need their store and their energy because of this transition, uh, this transition period that they're going through right now. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was just in the yard. You know, a lot of us have very high landscaping in our yard. If you actually kind of vary the heights of your landscaping in your yard, it actually will draw more birds during the migration. They like varied height levels. Um, it's just it's a it's a it's a tip that I've used and um, and it works really well. People that um, if you have old brush piles, those work really, really well um, for this time of year too. For finches, they'd love to go to the bottom of that brush pile and feel you know, very safe um, and secure away from any kind of predators. Um, so, so during migration, of course, you know, they need food, they need shelter, they need water. Now, what's happening this year? Um, what happened this year is birds that are typically located in the, uh, in the West. So like Pacific Northwest and Northern Canada, those birds are already starting to go South and they're starting to go East. So what does that mean for us this year? Um, it means that, um, 
when their growing conditions in Canada aren't ideal and those good boreal forests, right? The big, big just stretches of forest expanses. They didn't have a great growing season this year because it was very hot and it was very dry, right? So what happens is these birds, um, they'll, they'll, they'll go there because that's where they're supposed to be. Once the food is gone, they're going to go searching for more food. So typically what happens is they'll move south and they'll move east. So this winter, um, we, we have a winter finch forecast is what we call it. And the, the winter finch forecast is, is calling for an eruptive winter. And again, an eruptive forecast just means a change. There's just a change to the normal migratory pattern that they're taking. It's this word eruption. It's a, you know, not an eruption, an eruption. Um, so it's going to be just a difference in the way that they are uh, migrating this year. So some of the birds that, that we'll see at our feeders this year that we typically don't see, um, one is a pine siskin. So raise a hand. Anybody know what a pine siskin is? You, anybody know what a pine is? Okay. So it's a, it's a finch relative, um, cute little birds, um, little puffballs in the wintertime. Um, siskins, they, they usually live in the upper elevations in Western Canada. That's typically where they are. Um, I had a customer that was in yesterday. She lives in the valley and she told me that she has between 60 and 70 pine siskins a day right now on her feeders. They shouldn't be here this time of year. This is very abnormal for them to be here this time of year. So we know from the growing conditions that there's not gonna be a ton of natural food. So they're gonna have to push south. And then the other reason that we know that it's going to be an eruptive winter is because of citizen science. So we now we do this big citizen science experiment through Cornell, through the ornithology lab, through things like eBird, where we actually see physically on a real-time basis what people are seeing in their backyards. So pine siskins are going to be one that we see a, a bunch more this year. Um, they're, they're already starting to deplete the food sources, and you can see via, you know, spottings, you can see how they're already pushing south, which is going to be great for us. Um, we had a, a wonderful, wonderful production of spruce caterpillars this year, and that's one of their favorite foods um, that they like to feed them. So they're going to be back looking for those. Um, and just a fun fact about pine siskins. Um, they have a really tough time opening like a striped sunflower seed, but they love black oil sunflower seeds. They, they, they will eat a black oil sunflower seed, a siskin will. So the same stuff the cardinals eat, the siskins love. Um, the, the, the next one that we're going to see more of is everybody knows what a nuthatch is, right? The upside down bird, the bird that comes upside down. So we're used to the white breasted nuthatches here. Um, we see those quite often. This year, we're going to see more red breasted nuthatches. So red-breasted nuthatches are just a little bit smaller than the white-breasted nuthatch, um, but probably doubly as aggressive at the feeder. <laughs> they're aggressive little birds at the feeder, um, but they're gr that great that they're here because we typically wouldn't see them here. Um, we're seeing really good movement to the south already. Um, I personally have had three or four at my feeder, um, and last year I didn't have, I didn't see any last year. So this is a really good sign, um, and they will, they will stay. Uh, pretty much the entire winter into the spring. Um, they, they will stay for, for, for quite some time. Um, and then they'll move on and then they'll go to their breeding grounds, which are going to be far to the north. Um, the, the next one that we're going to see a lot is a purple finch. So I think a lot of people mistake a purple and a house finch. So the house finch has a really maroon head into kind of a gray body, whereas a purple finch has a very, very red wash on the top of its head. Um, it, if they were side by side, you'd, you'd know them immediately. Um, but again, um, purple finches are really on the rise because of that spruce, um, that spruce caterpillar. That's one of the main foods that they feed to their young. So they had a really, really productive breeding season this year. So we'll see more of them anyways. Yeah, Maggie, you want to unmute? Do you want to unmute your microphone? Okay, you, I can hear you now. Okay. You know, I'm not a real birder. Do you have pictures of these creatures? Yeah, sure do. Hold on one second. Da, 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 da. Stand you. by. I was just thinking the same okay. thing. <laughs> Stand that, that by. Would, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Let me do a little screen share here, okay? Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Do you do you see do you see the screen here? Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. So so Pine Siskin. I don't know if it'll go there. So you see that little bird right there? It it kind of looks like a pine siskin looks like a little finch, right? It kind of looks like a goldfinch with its wings. But the biggest difference, if you look at the breast, um, it's very, it's variegated. It's got a cream, a very cream and brown breast. So that's that's what a pine siskin is. Okay, so it looks looks like a little finch. They're they're a relative of the finch. And then this is a red-breasted nuthatch. So not too dissimilar from the white-breasted nuthatch, still the same streaks over the eyes, but it has a really rusty breast and it's, it is smaller. It is definitely smaller than a white-breasted nuthatch. So that's the red-breasted nuthatch right there. And then the, the finch that I just talked about, the purple finch, that's what a purple finch looks like. So very different from a house finch male in that the house finch male has a very gray body. The purple finch has a very white underbelly and tail. Um, that's the way to notice them immediately. And their, their head is literally, it's a raspberry color. I mean, it's, it's a very, very bright red raspberry versus a maroon um, like a house finch. So that's what a purple finch looks like. And then the last one um, that some of us um, don't get to see that often that we'll probably be really excited about are evening grosbeaks. So evening grosbeaks, we used to see a ton in this part of the world. Um, unfortunately, evening grosbeaks have, they're one of the species that has not done well at all. About 90% of the population has been lost. Um, you typically see these guys in Southern Ontario, but again, with the, with the growing season that they had versus what we had, we're definitely going to see these guys uh, down here more often. And they love, love black oil sunflower seed. Evening grow speaks, love black oil seed. So again, if you're feeding a good seed mix, you'll be able to attract, uh, you'll be able to attract these birds. So, you know, for, for us, this is fun because, um, hold on one second, I'm just going to stop the share. For us as, as birders, this is great because these are things that we don't get to see. We do not get to see um, uh, these birds that often. And, and for us, this is, this is pure joy because, wow, we're seeing different things than we've seen. And it's so dependent on the weather. I wish, this, I wish we could predict it every year, but it is so dependent on what everybody's doing. Um, Okay, let's talk about, so migration. I'm gonna kind of open it up. Bill, is it okay if I open it up to any questions about migration? Is that okay? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Hold on, monitoring. Okay. All right. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was- oh, It looks like Marilyn may have, she okay. unmuted. Yep. I'm, hi, Mrs. Pinsky, how are you? I'm good, Matt. Thank you. So this is a very naive question from a non-birder. But when you see the birds all heading in one direction and then the next day they're heading back again in another direction, is that because they're getting some kind of message about the weather? Um, no, it's actually, that's a great question. That's a really good question because sometimes you'll see geese flying south instead of north, right? Um, so, so all they're doing, they're just, it's food seeking. That is it. It's they're seeking food. And as long as there's good food on that territory, they're going to stay around. They'll stay around until they're, fill, uh, until they get their fill. And then yes, of course, whether that's, it's sunlight, it's really daylight that makes the biggest difference to them because th their energy, um, think about it being cold blooded, they, they have to really produce heat at night. So during the daytime when their bodies are naturally warm, that's great. They don't have to expend all this energy at nighttime with a, with a lack of daylight, they have to expend a lot more energy, which means they have to eat a lot more food. And as food supplies deplete, they have to go to a place where they're going to have, they're going to have a more ample, ample food supply. So no, it's a great question. Um, they're, they're really following the food. And then some birds, Marilyn, you know, it, really the migration depends on wind as well. Um, in, in April, um, mid-April of this year, we had a very, very strong, I'm like a 30 mile an hour uh, southerly wind that blew up so many hummingbirds took that, took that flight because again, they're native to the wind. 
right? They want it's hard for them to fly that that length. So if they can get aided from the wind and get a push, that's what they'll that's what they'll do. It's the same thing that the Orioles did this year is got a big aid and a push. So they know when they can push hard when they have help from the wind. Um, but for a bird to be just flapping its wings and flying over a body of water or something, you know, it's hard for them. I think of the raptors, they migrate uh, close to the shoreline. I mean, if they stop flying, they die. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're not getting out of the water. So um, they have to store up a lot of energy as they go. So during the migration, that's typically what they're doing. They're going from place to place. They're getting a really, really good nutrition. And then as the conditions are right, they'll stay there and eat and eat, and then they'll go on to their next place and go on to their next place. So it's a, it's a great question, but they're looking for food. They're, they're, they're packing and looking for food. Yes, Mark. Um, we're snowbirds ourselves. We go to Florida and we wonder when we should discontinue filling our bird feeders. Never. <laughs> no, I mean, come on. You, you want my answer? No, no. So, so people ask me this question quite a bit, which is, is there, is there a time in the year where you don't necessarily have to feed? You're going to get my stock answer, which is, I think it's important to feed them all year, all year round. But for people that don't do go, um, you know, I always say like, kind of like August through September is probably if you're going to pick a time to not feed, that might be the time to pick. Um, August, however, is kind of, it's an important finch month because the goldfinches all breed in August. So they're bringing their babies back to their feeder, to the feeders to teach them, you know, where to go. So that's important um, to me, but really in August, all your, all your um, seed heads um, are, are at peak production. So your, your, your uh, sunflowers, your black eyed Susans, all your cone flowers, they're all up then. So there's natural food sources. Um, there's still good bug hatches that are going on in August into September. And that's, they all eat bugs and they all eat worms. Every single one of them does. Um, so to answer your question, you know, probably, uh, a little bit before this time of year or after, but it, here's the thing. I mean, if you guys go every year, they, they will survive. I promise you they will. They, they, they make it through and they survive. We, we try to preach Mark. One of our, one of our philosophies is to have what we call a foundational feeder. So a foundational feeder means it's one thing that I'm going to commit to having seed in the whole year. I don't care if it's a small tube. I don't care if it's a window feeder, whatever that looks like. Okay. Because really your territory is established more so during the summer than it is in the winter. And what I mean by that is they need to know that they can breed there. So in order to be able to breed, they need a primary food source, which is going to be all those natural good things we talked about, bugs and seed and all those things with a good supplemental food source. If you keep those going, then it just keeps perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating. <coughs> so the two times a year that I would, if you're going to, you know, discontinue feeding, winter is definitely an important time of year to feed. And then, and then nesting season is definitely an important time of year to feed. So um, and nesting season lasts until late July, early August. Um, Cause birds all do nest at different points in time. And a lot of birds have multiple broods. Um, people don't realize that, you know, goldfinches, they have more than, they have more than two, either two or three broods a year. Um, doves have six. Doves will have six clutches of babies a year, which is just amazing. Wow. Well, there's a reason they have to, because they're doves um, and, and they get, <laughs> Holly's laughing. I know Holly. Um, uh, doves get taken by a lot. You know, that's nature knows how much it has to produce to get, to get through, which is interesting. So Mark, long, long answer is you're not going to hurt them. You're not going to hurt them by, by not feeding them. You won't. Um, and you know, your babies come back every year. You know, you, you, you know, your birds and that's that, that's the deal. You know, yours. Cause when you go outside, they don't get upset. They know you, um, you're, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're not going to hurt them. I promise. Anyone else? Any other questions on migration? Matt? Yes. Um, are you going to talk a little bit about um, the osprey um, migration? Our osprey that you know grew up in. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, there. thanks, um, Barb. No, um, uh, it's a good, it's a, it's a great thing. And I was kind, of, yeah, I was kind of transitioning into that with a, 
you know, from a COVID point of view and, and what's kind of gone on in the natural world. But, you know, as Barb pointed out, um, I don't know if any of you were familiar, some of you were obviously, but we had, um, we had ospreys that were nesting in our parking lot, believe it or not, in Fayetteville Town Center. Yeah. So they were um, right in front of the Stickley Audi building um, on, the far, on that far light post. It was a first year nest. Um, so uh, when everything, you know, whenever down in mid-March, um, you know, people went away and people were inside. Early April, um, I drove in one day and I saw a bunch of sticks underneath one of the light posts. I said, what is that? That's weird. And it didn't even dawn on, on me. I, I was walking out that day and I looked up and there was an osprey on top of that thing building a nest. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Well, this is some of the things that have happened as a result of, of COVID, right? We have animals that are now coming back. They're reclaiming their territory. I guarantee you, if it was business as normal, they never would have nested in that parking lot, ever, ever, ever nested in that parking lot. Now that they have, they had two babies that fledged successfully um, and they're gone, that they've made their migration. Um, and then the, the odds are because Osprey are mated and they're paired for life, the odds are that they're gonna come back because they were successful fledging and have more babies in that nest and just continue to build it up and build it up and build it up. So, so Barb, that's a, um, it's a, it's a great segue um, um, because the raptors do migrate as well. P peak uh, raptor migration is September. That's when the majority of raptors are migrating. That's your, that's your ospreys, that's your, that's your hawks, um, that's your harriers, your falcons, all those guys. That's when they're migrating is September. Owls are a little bit later. Um, owls are late September into October, um, but the raptors, the raptors do leave in September. But what a wonderful story, right? Here we are sitting in the middle of um, a mall for all intents and purposes, and these beautiful birds found a place to to raise their young. And I think what's happening, and and some of the uh, popularity gain, pardon me, in birding right now is because people are at home right? There's a lot of us that are at home. There's a lot of us that were at home, but we're going out, but now we're forced to be at home a little bit more. Um, I can tell you that a lot of the new customers that we have coming in um, are people that are working from home. They got really into gardening this year. You know, I think anybody that gardens, and I'm, I'm by show of hands, I'd say that 95% of us on here garden as well. They go hand in hand. Uh, blooms and blooms and bugs and birds go hand in hand. So, I think as people were um, uh, at home, people are actually staring out their window. Um, you know, I in the work world. I mean, Pam, God bless you. Um, Pam's, Pam, Pam doesn't have a, a great window to look out at, right? I mean, this is the, I, I, I've been to her office. No, so, you know, we're lucky. Most of us look at a cubicle or most of us, if we're lucky to look out of a window, we might have a tree, right? Well, what happens? You're home, you start observing what's going on in your yard. You start getting your hands into your yard and you're like, wow, there's a really, really neat ecosystem that's going on here in this backyard. I, I say this all the time. I want to see lions. I want to see tigers. I want to see bears. Who doesn't want to see all those cool animals, right? But mm -hmm. if you just open your eyes in your backyard, there is, there's this whole biosphere of, of life that's happening all the time. And it's just, it's fascinating if you just stop to watch it. And I really think that this time has given people pause to do that. Um, it's given people an outlet, um, a therapeutic outlet. It's something that we can still enjoy doing at our homes um, while a number one, not putting ourselves in danger. Um, and number two, not having anybody put us in danger, right? By, by being out and about. Um, during, during the COVID pandemic, which we're still square, like say, during, um, we're still squarely in it. Um, you know, it was one of our big things here. One of our big missions was to make sure that people could participate in this hobby still while they were at home. Um, so we did everything within our power. I, I mean, making 15 to 18 home deliveries a day, um, you know, just to make sure that people could have this blessing and this respite of being able to watch nature while there was so much nastiness that's going on in the world, right? So I think that this is kind of a, it's it's great because people are definitely getting back in tune with their environment. People are definitely getting back in tune with nature. I'm a child of the late 70s and early 80s. 
what I've seen during this is what I saw when I was a kid. People riding around their neighborhood, talking to their neighbors, playing outside. You know, I, I'm seeing a lot of the things that we grew up doing that are now that are now being passed down. And I can tell you, we've had so many teenagers, children, teachers that have come in that have really enjoyed this hobby. And, and it's just a brief, again, it's a brief respite from what's going on uh, out there in the world. But this has become a very, very popular uh, hobby um, during, uh, during COVID. So is there anybody that just got into this during, you know, just got into bird feeding during, during this time, during the, um, during the quarantine? Or has anybody been feeding for a long time? Anybody new? Okay, we got some experienced folks here then. That's good. That's a good thing. Um, okay. Can I so ask does a question? It, yeah, yeah, Janet. Yes. Um, I have some birdhouses around my property, which are usually they're full of nests in the, in the spring yes. and summer. Yeah. But now I've been noticing, particularly sparrows, going into the birdhouses and looking in the birdhouses and hopping on top of them is, is almost as if they were lurking looking for a winter home, but they don't ever go in there. I'm just wondering what that phenomenon means. Um, I mean, they might be, if they've nested in there before, they might just be be protective of that territory. But there are, I mean, I have, I have nest boxes around my property. There's definitely birds that go roost in there in the winter. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't, they're not nesting, obviously, but it's, it's just a place for them to, to, to have shelter. shelter. Yeah. yeah, it's just a shelter place. So again, you know, talking about that, the base and Maslow needs, it's food, water, shelter, they'll find yeah. anything to shelter. And even, you know, even pine trees are shelter, right? So as pine boughs come down, there's insulation that gets trapped between mm -hmm. those pine pine boughs. So, you know, if you ever notice when frost comes, there's never frost underneath a pine tree. It's because mm -hmm. there's insulative value that gets yeah. that gets stuck in those branches. So, you know, any any place like that where they can feel safe and secure um, is is going to is going to do them well. And I'll tell you, I have a couple of covered feeders, you know, where the where the top comes down over the top. Right. In the wintertime, those are always where the birds are. They they like to eat in the you know, out of the wind and, 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 yeah. uh, uh, in a pleasant environment, um, mm -hmm. as well as we do too. So no, but that's a, that's a good question, Janet. And, um, Janet actually brings up another point talking about house sparrows, right? Um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but house sparrows, um, and European starlings are the only two, um, birds that aren't protected under the uh, Migratory Bird Act because they're not native. So house sparrows, if you do see house sparrows that are occupying nest boxes, you are more than within your rights to evict them. Um, I'm not getting into any personal views or political views, but is you're perfectly within your right to evict those um, and European starling nests as well. You're perfectly within your rights to evict. They're just, there's no natural predators for them um, because they are, um, because they're foreign. Hold on. I had one question come in from the chat. Uh, the question was from, uh, from Holly. Thanks for the question. Should you clean out the houses in fall or wait till the spring? Um, you can, you can clean them out now. That's absolutely fine. Um, or you can leave the natural materials in there. That's fine too. There's no right answer. I know, I know what I do in my nest boxes this time of year is I do clean them and then I just put some bark in there, you know, just mulch. I literally just put mulch on the bottom because I don't, because I'm spoil my birds and I don't like the idea of their little little tushies touching the cold bottom of the floor. So I like to raise up a little bit so they're not touching cold floor. But that's probably overkill. Janet, it's probably overkill. I'm guessing, I'm guessing this is going to be overkill. But uh, but no, um, and even in between broods, um, you, you can absolutely clean out a box in between broods. Eastern bluebird boxes, um, people clean out the old nest so they can build a, so they can build a new nest. So that is absolutely fine. Um, either, either spring or winter to clean them, clean them out. Um, I clean mine out both. Um, like I said, I, I put some bark in mine. I just like it for a little winter roost. I know I'm giving somebody some shelter. Okay, Pam, is there black oil sunflower in the no mess blend? Okay, good question. No, there's something better than black oil sunflower in the no mess blend, which is sunflower hearts. So what Pam was asking was different types of food, you know, black oil sunflower seed being the, the, the traditional. I mean, I grew up around, my dad was a prolific bird feeder 
all we ever fed was millet and black oil. That's it. That's all we ever, that's all we ever had was millet and black oil. Did we draw a large variety? Absolutely. We had a ton of birds, but what we know now is that adding some different things at different points in the year actually does help them tremendously. So Pam's question was for black oil seed. Um, is there any of that? We have a blend that's called a no mess blend. So there's no shells on anything. So there's not any of the black oil seed in that blend with the shell on it, but there's tons of it without the shell on it. And in the winter time in particular, you know, birds have to conserve energy. So if they're able to take a sunflower heart and not have to drill down and open up that shell, it does conserve a lot of energy for them. Um, to just be able to take that raw food and eat it like that. So good question, Pam. Any other questions about food? Okay, no questions um, about- Matt, can, can I ask one related question? So then, because you said the evening grosbeaks speaks in the pine siskins, love that. Yes. Black oil. So will they, I've never seen a evening grosbeak. speak so I would love to attract them. Will They'll they take come sunflower the hearts. It, <laughs> here's the thing. When I say black oil seed, right? It's the, it's the black oil sunflower seed. The stuff that's inside of that black oil seed, everything eats. Everything eats that, including bluebirds. You know, bluebirds can't crack a shell. Um, they have such soft beaks, they cannot crack a black oil shell. They'll take some hearts. They'll take some sunflower chips or sunflower hearts, but they can't crack a shell. But Pam, to answer your question, my finches... All they eat is sunflower hearts. That's it. I can't put out Niger. I, they'll eat black oil too, but it's sunflower hearts. They're spoiled. Mine are spoiled. Oh, well, I'm a good bird, dad. What, what can I say? What can I say? So yeah, so to attract those guys, um, you know, just keep doing the same stuff that you've been doing. It's, it's, they will, they have to find it. And the way that they find it is they see other birds going to that feeding station and finding it. Um, so, um, oh, thanks, Bill. Um, you know, they have to see other birds that are doing that to feel, to feel comfortable with going in there. Once they do, it's, it's going to be a home run. I mean, siskins are finches, uh, gross beaks are gross beaks. I mean, same family as cardinals, right? So when they get on, when they get on sun, when they get on, uh, uh, sunflower, they're, they're on it. They're just on it. Cause Pam, your cardinals eat your no mess. Um, I don't get that many cardinals anymore, but, okay. uh, okay. you know, they, that, primarily what I feed. So when they are there, yeah. they're eating that. Yeah. So same, same family, gross beak, same cardinal. And beak. the same as the rose breasted gross beak. Same family, same yeah. exact family. Yep. Yeah. All the pretty ones are gross beaks yeah. <laughs> or buntings. I've got, I've, or buntings. Got, got the red breasted nut hatches there already. So that's exciting. Yeah. I was going to ask that to the group. Has anybody seen any of the birds that I mentioned earlier, the, any siskins or purple finches or, 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 or rose breasted or red breasted? Nut red breast, yeah. 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 We're seeing more and more. Um, we're seeing more and more right now. Um, and then, you know, what's happened. The other thing that I wanted to talk about kind of in transitioning, and I know I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for, for questions as well. Um, but kind of what's happening right now as birds are leading up to their to wintering, right? So if you're if you're seeing that your feeder right now a lot of increased activity, um, there's there's a very specific reason is because birds are doing what they call caching seed right now. So a cache is just a store, right? It's a store of supplies, um, and and what they do is they'll take seed and they hide it all over their territory. Okay, so some birds that are that are known for this. Jays are blue jays in particular are known for cash and seed. Blue jays will take 30 to 40 peanut splits in their mouth and they'll go all over their territory and they'll hide it. A jay has about a two and a half mile square territory, so they put it everywhere. Chickadees, nut hatches, woodpeckers, tufted tip mice, they all hide seed. So what's happening right now, we call this caching season or peanut season because they're taking really high fat foods and they're storing them up for the winter. They're getting their winter stores ready. Um, chickadees are amazing when it comes to caching seed. A chickadee can remember, this is insane, up to a month later where it put all of its seed, every single seed that it mm. cached, it knows where it is. Chickadees also, they have this ability to make a hierarchy 
in where they hide their seed. So in other words, they have seed that's kind of nutritious, right? It's kind of does the job. And then they have the stuff that's really nutritious. So when times are really, really lean, they go to that super nutritious pile. When times are okay and they're skating through, they go to the least nutritious. So it's just, it's amazing how they can even differentiate between their stores. Um, another fun fact about chickadees, if a chickadee catches you watching it hide a seed, it will hide it. It will wait till you go away. It will take the seed and hide it somewhere else. It's absolutely amazing. It's amazing what they do. Um, so yeah, so that's what's happening right now is this transition time. Migration, we're going into fall. So all of these birds, they know in order to survive here in the winter, they have to have a store of seed. They have to have stuff already set up for them to get into. Um, chickadees without access to a feeder in the winter have about a 30% survival rate. That's it. One in three chickadees survives. If they have access to a feeder or to food, it's about a 70% survival rate. So it does go up. It doubles, you know, their survival rate doubles um, if they have access to access to food. Um, but that's what's going on right now is this pre-wintering. They're also looking at, um, to Janet, to your point, they're also looking at places where they can roost right now. They're looking at places where they can hide in the winter um, because that's going to be important for them to get to the next season. Um, so they're kind of doing, it's almost like nesting season, but it's an extended net. They're trying to figure out where they're going to hunker down and how to best get through this winter. And that's, again, why these birds start to flock together. That's why you're going to see flocks of 20 or 30 cardinals at the same time. They're not interested in territory rights anymore. They're just interested in pure survival. That's what they're doing. They're just trying to get through uh, mm -hmm. to next year, so. Probably. <laughs> so it's caching season, peanut season. If you're not feeding peanuts right now, it's a fun thing to, it's a fun thing to feed. Unless you want to, unless you got a bunch of squirrels like me, then you're feeding everything. Then you're feeding everything. So any other questions about migration, about kind of what's happening in the fall, in the fall season, it's an exciting season right now. Um, it's one of my favorites just because we get to see things come and go. Um, say goodbye to my, say goodbye to my yearly visitors. Yes, Janet. Whenever you uh, see uh, Canada geese flying and they're always honking and I'm wondering if they need to honk when they're flying to, to create some kind of even air pressure. Why do they? Um, that's a really good, that's a really good question. I, you know, I don't know that answer. Um, my guess is it has something to do with the hierarchy of, of how they're flying and where they're flying because somebody that's at the front of the V formation, they're probably not gonna be able to be there for too long um, just because they're cutting all the air. So my guess is it's some kind of a communication system that they have with each other. Um, but it's a good question. I, I, I truly, I, I don't know. I don't even know if there's been research that's done on that. I know they just honk. I, <laughs> that's all I know. That's all I know. But, but my guess is, my guess is it's some kind of group communication system, just mm -hmm. like most of these animals are, you know, there's calls, there's alerts, there's mm -hmm. warnings. It might all sound like the same honk to us, but it might have a completely different meaning, right. you know, to them. So, I mean, their pitch, I mean, think about birds pitch. It's, it's eight, it's eight times a grand piano in terms of pitch up and down. So those little nuances are really picked up by them that we probably wouldn't even hear. Yeah, okay. good question. Very good question. Matt, is it true that um, turkey vultures migrate? Oh, absolutely. Turkey my Turkeys are some turkey, of the biggest migrators. and. Vultures. Yeah. yeah, turkey vultures, the TVs yeah. migrate big time. Um, you'll see them here early in the spring and now they're on their way back. Um, they ride a lot of thermoplanes. So, so their migration pattern typically has them going through peaks and valleys because valleys are going to push air up. And they are, if you ever see them in the air, they kind of just soar. They're kind of like hang gliders. They just kind of hang there and soar. So anything with updrafts, that's why they kind of go along uh, uh, valleys um, and ridges is because the updraft from the valley kind of keeps them keeps them afloat as they go. But yes, big migrating bird is a turkey. But, but some of them stay just like geese, I think. Oh, sure. I, Absolutely. I see them all winter around my neighborhood. You Absolutely. Know. Some, some osprey stay, okay. you know, some, I, that, like I said earlier in the talk, you know, just if it's a species that migrates, it doesn't mean that it won't stay. 
do, does that make sense? Um, yeah. um, some do. Some have great success staying here. Um, you know, I think about like a like a Blue Jay, right? I don't think a Jay would survive anywhere else but here. I mean, you go up to Canada. That's the only songbird that's a, that's around is a is a Jay. Okay, from Pam. How far south do raptors migrate? Oh. Um, some just go. Honestly, some will just go to like Baltimore. You know. To, just so the water's open, uh, just until the water's open and they can fish. I mean, they're, they're hardy birds. They're definitely hardy birds. Um, so they can survive, but again, Talk about it's the osprey. pardon me. Talk about the osprey migration. Yeah. So, so yeah, the osprey migration, just like all other raptors starts in September. Um, they'll hug the shoreline typically going south. And again, they're just going to stop along the way. They're going to hunt as long as the hunt is good for them. They're going to stay. That's it. I mean, they're going to follow the food. They're going to follow the light down south. They obviously they fish. Um, so they need open water to do that. Um, but we have eagles that migrate and do the same thing. We'll have eagles that migrate and or don't migrate and stay here. So again, when we're, when we're talking about the migration, you know, this is kind of the majority of them would do this. But there's there's definitely cases. I mean, you see osprey here in the in the wintertime, no doubt. You absolutely will see osprey here in the wintertime. But, but the majority of them do migrate, just like the majority of TVs migrate, just like the majority of hawks migrate. It's majority of them do, but there's always exceptions. Always, always, I, always. I read in, um, well, I don't know where I read it, but um, that um, the ospreys go as far south as South America. Um, I would think that that would be a big flight from here, maybe maybe yeah. from Southern US, um, but that, man, that would be a big old flight. That's a big bird to take that flight, but I, hey, I, I, nothing would surprise me. It's nature. The second we think we have everything figured out, the chaos theory reigns and it goes the other way. Oh, Jane, Jane, can you unmute your, Jane, can you unmute your, um, your microphone? We're trying to unmute her. What happens oh, yeah. to gulls? oh, there she goes. What happens to gulls? You know, on the there's so many in the in the summer on the lakes and all. Do they stay all winter? Uh, some gulls will stay. The majority of them leave. Um, honestly, Jane, the reason that they're here is because people throw trash on the ground. That's that's it. I mean, there wouldn't be a single gull in this plaza if there wasn't people eating here. There just there wouldn't be. But they're gulls. they're not the ones that uh, we don't like, and then we like the starlings and. Oh no, gulls are great. The gull, gulls yeah. are fantastic. It's just you know this isn't their this isn't native habitat for them. I mean, Green Lakes is certainly that would be a place where they would stop over and go. Okay. But like like and the gulls that are in the parking lots and stuff like that, you know, the reason that they're here is there was, when I say there was no gulls here in April, and like none, there was not a single gull that was here. It's because the parking lot was clean. People weren't throwing stuff on the ground. They're, they're, they're just looking for a quick, easy meal. Um, it's funny because there's this causation that happens, right? So, you know, we think that they like to be here because of X, Y, or Z, when most of the time it's just, it is food related. Um, I'm talking but, about the um, lake, the lakes, the gulls that are on the lake, you know, on Lake Ontario. And, and that, yeah, oh no, a lot of them will stay. A, a lot of them will stay. And again, it just depends on the water being frozen or not. Yeah, you know? it, if they have a viable food source, they have a viable food they source and they'll stay. stay. They're hardy. They're big birds, you know, that, that they can survive definitely through the winter. I mean, you go to the shore, you go to the New York shore in the winter time, there's tons of gulls still around there. So, um, so yeah, but we were talking about causation, you know, one of the places where you see most red tail hawks <laughs> and people that have traveled up and down 81 will, will agree with me. There's tons of hawks, red tails up and down I 81. I mean, tons in the trees and, the reason, the real reason is because people throw trash out of their car onto the shoulders of the road. And then what goes to eat the trash on the shoulders of the road, the chipmunks, the squirrels, the mice. So that's just easy pickings for them. You know, it's funny. You have, you almost have to follow the food chain back down to, to, to really realize why they're, why they are where they are. Yes, Pam. 
So, you know, like a long, I'm not sure what the root number is, but it's like parallel to the throughway by Montezuma and that whole stretch, uh, Cuyahoga, yeah, Seneca Lake. Route five, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I'm not sure. It's 20. It's 20. 20? Yeah. It's 20, yep. So are those osprey nests up all on top of the utility poles? Yeah. And are they, they looks like there's platforms. Did Montezuma set up platforms for them? Correct. Correct. Okay. And if you go, if you go up to like the Thousand Islands or you go down south to any of the coastal towns, you'll mm -hmm. see those big platforms set up specifically for, for Osprey. Now, some of them, I know a few of them have been occupied by Eagles too, which is, that's cool, you know. Um, but yeah, those platforms are typically by ospreys because ospreys need a plat. They can't just build a nest in a tree. They actually they need that flat surface to build their nests. So, so that's like in your parking lot, the, they built it on top of the light because that was the platform. Correct. And interestingly, okay. in the parking lot, that's one of the only lights that has three spokes. So it looks like a peace sign versus a light that's side by side in most parking lots. So they actually use that whole surface area of the three spokes to, to build their nest. Yeah, so that, that provided a natural platform for them. Yep, so in Montezuma, those are, the majority of those are osprey nests. And they're big. You see how, you see how they build them out every year. They just keep yeah, building they're huge. and building they're huge. and building and building. They just get, they get big, 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 you know. Yeah, Frank. Do we ever see anything other than a ruby-throated hummingbird up here? That is the reason a I ask is yeah. that I see occasionally in the fall uh, a dark purpley-throated hummingbird. And it, uh, Sibley shows that without explaining what it is, shows it under the ruby-throated and also the, I think they call it a black-throated bird. Uh-huh. So no, yeah, good question, Frank. Um, typically here, um, it's going to be ruby throated 900, 999,000 times out of a million, it's going to be a ruby. We absolutely will get stray rufuses, we'll get some stray black throated, and we'll get some stray uh, broad tails as well. All the other ones, they're so West Coast driven. That's their migration pattern. The only the only way we really truly tend to get those is if something's blown really far off course. Um, an, an example of that, Frank, not just hummingbirds, but there was a painted bunting in Central Park last year. You know, I, I mean, a painted bunting shouldn't be north of Savannah, really, but but that's where it was. So, you know, it. Anything is possible, just the migratory paths, we, tip, we tend to get rubies. Now, I can tell you my friends on the West Coast, they're completely jealous of the songbirds we get because they don't get the songbirds we get. They get all these beautiful hummingbirds, um, but they don't see goldfinches and they don't see cardinals and they don't see nuthatches and they don't see all those good birds too. But yeah, to answer your question, Frank, it's incredibly possible that something else is there. Um, or it could be a variant, you know, it could be some kind of a variant of a, of a ruby as well. You know, birds definitely have some variation to them. Um, uh, they don't all look totally identical, but that's a great question, Frank. Very good. Well, question. then does the ruby throated appear sometimes in the year with a purple throat? Um, I think maybe depending on the angle of the sun. Yeah. I mean, that gorget, you know, the, the, the thing that's underneath, it's called a gorget. I think just the way that it glints from the light, you know, depending on if it's in the summertime where the sun angle is coming from the top or, you know, closer to fall where it's a little bit flatter, you absolutely might see a different flash of color. Sure. It's a hundred percent possible. Yeah. Oh, thank absolutely. you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm going to open it up to the group. So if there's any if there's any questions, please please fire away. Um, th this is Maggie. Um, what do you call those those swoops of little birds? <laughs> I'm so technical. No, that's um, okay that come I mean there's like 200 birds and they little black ones little house finches or something and they they swoop down and then they make all these like figure eights in the skies there's a there's a term for it and I don't remember what it is is it a, a chimney swift no no they're they're just 
little blackbirds that are out in the fields at this time of year. Oh, so it's going to be either right. red wing, probably red wing blackbirds or uh, or grackles would be my guess. Okay, let's big, go with big grackles. flocks of them, like big three hundred flocks. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's probably it's probably red wings. Um, they're really really banded together this time of year. I'll tell you, at my feeder last week, I probably had 120 that bombed me at one point in time. I mean, you just, you couldn't even see the feeders. They covered everything. Um, but the, the, good, the good news about them is they're definitely headed south right now, but they do band together just like other birds up here band together for the winter. They band together for their migration. Same reasons, predators, more chance, better chance at food, better chance at survival, all those things. So yeah, they're, um, they get really, really packy this time of year. Big time packy. Okay, thank you. Yes, Pam. Um, on that banding topic, you mentioned about the chickadees and the tufted titmice. Like, mm -hmm. so do they, like both species to get band together to help Correct. protect each other? Okay. Correct, yeah, because they're, they're part of the same family. So, so yeah, so they, they will absolutely come together and, and at the feeder right now, I saw it last night, there was three tufties and three chickadees on the feeder at the same time last night. Yeah. I've been noticing a lot of them together. They start to ball together Yeah, for that exact reason that survival it's, it's more eyes equals better survival on all accounts, better chance to find water, better chance to find food, better chance to alert from predators. It, it's like a, it's a triple win for them. So yeah, good question. Patty, did you have a question? Go ahead, un unmute your microphone. I think Patty is unmuted. Oh, I'm, I think, yes, I no, think yeah. the more showers wanted to chime in. Okay. So is there any etiquette um, when they're waiting to get to your bird feeder? You know, I see them like on deck in the tree waiting for their turn. And then sometimes it seems like they're, they shove each other off and that kind of thing. Depends on how hungry they are. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you, you, you'll you always see, this is, this is just the lineup in my yard. The chickadees are always waiting first, right? The chickadees are there waiting patiently. The downies are right behind them. Um, yeah, it's, it truly depends on how hungry they are. It really does. Like finches, finches are typically more patient eaters. They'll kind of wait their turn, but you get a bunch of blue, hungry blue jays and, <laughs> Oh, bro, yeah. watch well, out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's going to be World War III yeah. there. Yeah. Just make sure I'm caught up on here. Good place to find the house to fall. Operations. Okay. Uh, I see, Bill. Thank you for that. Yeah, a group yeah. of Shakespearean fans are are responsible for that. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, absolutely correct. And the interesting part is starlings. European starlings are one of the most coveted feeder birds in in England. Um, the English love their starlings. They love their magpies. They love their crows. Um, and actually, the gentleman who uh, designed Central Park, I believe, was British. And that was another reason that they were here is they wanted pairs of everything in, in Central Park. So, yep. yay, invasive species. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe that the um, backstory, they wanted um, a pair of every bird's mentioned in any, every single Shakespeare play. It was like 600 some odd species. And Correct. so they, yeah. Well, loose 100 starlings. And then that's that. <laughs> and that was enough. And yeah. that's that. You know, it's funny you mention that because like yeah. domestic birds, right? So something like a peach face lovebird, which is kept domestically typically by people, they're now feeder birds all over the Southwest. I mean, there's flocks of peach, peach face lovebirds that go around there. Arizona, kind of that Sun Valley area. I mean, they're just a bunch of parrots flying in the sky. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting what happens. Um, when these things get back out in their natural, you know, their natural habitat. It's, it's, it's really interesting, actually. Yep. Any other questions from the group?
Oh, I have a question. Yes, um, sir. In, um, so on top of um, keeping our bird feeders full, what are the best things that we can be doing to support birds, um, you know, in times past COVID, um, once society kind of shifts back to normal? I got, I got three easy actions that everybody can take that will help tremendously. If you have cats, keep them indoors. That is a huge step that people can take to protect the birds. We lose over, you ready for this number? We lose over 300 million birds a year to cats. 300 million. It's quite a few birds, okay? Cats are outdoor animals. It's not cat's fault. They're just being a cat and, and certainly understand that piece. But as responsible pet owners, we have to realize the reverb that these things do take. Um, I'm all for outdoor cats. Just make a run. No different than a dog. Make a dog, make a cat run. No different than a dog run. So do a catio. And the second step that everybody can take, put something in your window. Window strikes take hundreds of millions of birds a year as well. Um, so anything that you can do to break up that window, I don't care if it's a grid, hang a sun catcher, um, anything that you can do to break up a big, big picture window um, will help. Um, unfortunately, there was an article a week and a half ago or so, you know, warblers were really migrating hard. And um, in Philadelphia, um, there were literally thousands of them falling out of the sky because they were hitting buildings, but thousands of warblers falling out of the sky. It, this, this happens, so we need to really protect ourselves from window strikes. And then the, the, the third action, so, so I think those are pretty easy. Try to keep your cats indoors, put stuff in your windows. The third action is to try to let your, try to native plantings help tremendously. So anytime that you can reduce the footprint of your lawn and increase the footprint of native plantings, um, it's not only is it good for birds, but it's good for, for all species um, that are in the area. So that kind of life cycle, that whole life cycle is, is really important. So those, I think that those are three of the actions. And then, you know, common sense stuff, use less plastic, you know, pesticides are, are bad. You know, pesticides are really bad. Um, even if you're trying to do some rodent, um, you know, rodent um, removal or extermination, you don't know, think about what you're giving them as well, because birds can end up eating those rodents um, as well. So, you know, just, just kind of being conscious of what's out there, how we're trying to manage that and how it all fits into the, into the bigger picture. Less plastics, obviously. I mean, there's, there's so many little things that we can do um, that'll help. But the three biggest are cats indoors, put something in your window and, and, and try to grow some native plants. Those are the three biggest things that we could do that would help the avian world right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Pam does have a question in the chat. Oh. Yep. Oh yeah. Common red poles. Yeah, the, it'll be an eruptive season for red poles as well. Um, so Pam's question was about a bird called a. Uh, 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 oh, Doug Talme. Yes, thank you, Holly. I yes, Doug's the man. Uh, um, Pam's question is uh, about red poles. So red poles are, are are a species of bird. Yes, they will be here in droves this year. And the best place to look at red poles, there's a, I can't remember the name of the hemp farm. There's a hemp farm down like Tully Fabius area. The red poles literally in like January, they will be all over every hemp head, like, like flocks of hundreds of them will be there. So, and, and, and again, we'll know this because you can look at this stuff. You can see exactly today where birds are on, on a program that Cornell has called, uh, called eBird. You can literally see today where those things are happening, um, which is, that's the great part. So if Pam happens to see 20 red poles in her yard and she's able to report that, hey, I had 20 red poles in my yard. Great. Those are data points. All we're doing is citizen science. That's exactly what we're doing. All of us are taking this little piece and saying, okay, today from noon to 1230, I counted this many birds and, and here we go. That's it. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for, for that. Yep. Um, yep. Thank you so much for that. And yes, Holly, um, I will plug Doug as well. Uh, Doug is the absolute unequivocal master 
of native plantings. Um, he was actually going to do um, a, a talk, I believe, in Skinny Atlas last year. I think it was like April, but I know it got, I know COVID wiped that out. So, um, but man, I was excited to go to that talk. I was so excited to go to that talk, but always next year, always next year. Matt, what what birds eat bees? Oh, Orioles will eat bees. Um, any of your flycatchers will definitely eat bees. Um, Cardinals won't eat them. Cardinals will occasionally eat a bee. Jays will definitely eat them. Um, woodpeckers definitely will eat bees. Um, but they like the larvae more than anything than the actual bee itself. I mean, will they bee- eat the lot? Will they eat them dead? <laughs> the reason I asked this question is you just brought up about be careful in what you might kill rodents with. I don't, I, we use no pesticides or fertilizers around our property, but we have, we are having a problem with bees that have burrowed into our wall. And we're at a point where I think we have to get an exterminator or something because, but I don't want to, now you brought up that about, so I don't want to poison the birds. (laughs) No, you have, I know what you have. You have carpenter bees. I I, I had the same. No, no, they're like, they're, that's the big fuzzy, huge one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're not those. They're like in, they've gone in through the masonry wall. Anyway, this is like off track, but they're, they're more like, regular, I don't know, I don't know, bee types, <laughs> but they're not yeah. those big carpenter bees. Yeah. No, I, you know what, mitigation, I, I mean, I would probably try to mitigate it in the early, early spring, because my guess is that they're laying larvae there right now. So if you can get them at that larvae stage, that's probably a really good thing. Um, it, you're not, there's, Pam, honestly, there's not a ton. I mean, yes, do birds eat bees? Sure. It's not, their preferred food. It, larvae, the bee larvae would be woodpecker heaven. Um, but again, I don't think that, that would be too affected by what you're, by what you're doing. I don't. Okay. I say go forward. <laughs> Anyone else? I guess we may as well wrap up then. Um, um, one more. Was, yes, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, is there a bird hotline um, in this area? When I first moved to uh, the Syracuse area, there was somebody who used to make a weekly recording. Um, I think it was an older person who is now deceased. Um, but um, I just wondered if there was a, like a hotline that, you know, and then people rush out to see if they can find this bird and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so Bill in the chat on the side, um, Mm -hmm. Bill put a link to, um, there is, but it's not a call in line. It's all online now. It's called, it's called eBird. Um, so there's a link to it that Bill put in the, uh, in the chat it's eBird.org. And then, and then what you do is you can go to any of those maps and you can literally say, what are we seeing today? And it's going to give you a, a real snapshot of every bird that we're seeing, you know, in this area and where they were seen and what date they were seen, which is kind of neat. So not so much a bird hotline as a, uh, as a, as a citizen science thing. Now Onondaga um, Autobahn, I believe does put out still a rare bird sighting. I believe they do that still, um, which is on their website, but I honestly, to be honest with you, I haven't been on their on their site in, in a while. So okay. the um, person was Eber, E-B-E-R? E B E R? E Ebird, E B I R D oh. dot O R G. Ebird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can, that's an app too that you can download to your phone. And you can literally just sit in your backyard and go count. Okay. Two Robins, two Cardinals, three Blue Jays. <laughs> do it for a half hour, hit submit. And then it puts all those data points into uh, into a citizen science map, which is really cool. 
Oh, thank you, Bill, for linking that. Uh, and Bill just linked the Onondaga Autobahn rare bird alert um, on the on the right. So, so yeah, there there's definitely some rare birds that we see and kind of those holy grail birds that we want to go after. I think we probably all have our lifetime list of things that we want to see. Mine is a snow bunting coming out of a bush right beside me while I'm having a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I should live here if that's what I want, though. Yeah. Right.